morning I'd like to look at a section of scripture that really gives the believer a critical perspective um, in himself or herself and that which God has called us to do in uh, reaching the world with the gospel. The title of the message this morning is The Confounding Message and Messenger of God. And we'll be focused this, this morning on verses 17 through 31, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 through 31. The outset of this letter, and if you joined us in our last um, Sunday school study, um, we worked our way through the entire book of 1 Corinthians over a period of about 13 weeks. And so uh, if you joined us for that, you, you're familiar with the content of this letter that Paul wrote. But in the outset of this letter, we find Paul, in verses 10 through 16, addressing the matter of divisions that existed within the church in the city of Corinth. Apparently, identity politics was being practiced in this church on a spiritual level. We talk about it in our politics of today, this idea of identity, identity politics, dividing people up into groups. Sometimes it happens in the church. It's not a healthy thing. Paul was writing this letter by and large to deal with this, one of their primary issues. They were placing themselves in groups based upon who they had picked as their spiritual leader, who had influenced them the most as a spiritual leader. And this created contention among the church members, which was reported uh, to Paul. We find in verse 11, it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, Chloe, that there are contentions among you. He's rightfully concerned, and he writes uh, this letter in part to rebuke them and to encourage them to be perfectly joined together in the same mind in judgment. What he means by that is that you need to learn to think and to act biblically. Verse 12, we see, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am Cephas, and I am Christ. And he asks the question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So in order to correct their thinking, in order to help them think biblically, he emphasizes the insignificance of him and the other spiritual leaders in the work of the Lord among them. And he points out to these people, look, it doesn't matter who baptized you. It's all about the Lord and this church. And in verses 17 through 31, we find... Uh, uh, we find that his strategy in uniting them is to unite them around the message of the gospel and the power of God in the gospel. He knew that this would divert their attention from an unhealthy and ultimately a divisive focus upon men. It's all too often in our churches today that people are divided along these lines, lines of human leadership, or other lines. The solution is always the same. Get your focus back on the gospel and the responsibility that God has given you to preach the gospel. Follow along as I read verses 17 and 31. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with, the, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. But preaching the cross is to them that perish foolishness. 
But on us, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ, Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men act the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pause for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for these powerful truths. May I ask Lord, that they would have a powerful effect on our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, I, I pray that there would be nothing left unsaid this morning that you want said. Lord, there would be nothing said this morning that you don't want said. I pray that your spirit would be the ultimate guide and leader, the ultimate teacher, as we look at this passage of scripture, we want you to be glorified. We want your word to prosper. Lord, we want your name to be lifted up. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to see two simple thoughts this morning, two topics that Paul addresses in this passage of scripture. Number one, I'd like you to see the gospel message. The gospel message. And we find that in verses 17 through 25. Verses 17 through 25. I'd like you to see, first of all, about the gospel message, its importance. These uh, believers in this church were bragging about who baptized them. And Paul says in verse, uh, in verse uh, 14, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say I had baptized in my own name. And then he says in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but what? To preach the gospel. So we see, number one, the gospel. And we see in the gospel, we see, number one, its importance. The gospel Paul is making here, the point to them, the gospel is central. It is the message. It is the purpose. The singular focus of the servant of God is the proclamation of the gospel. It was the heartbeat of Paul's ministry. Every place God sent him, his goal, his purpose was to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And outside of the good news message, Paul saw nothing valuable for the world. Notice what he says in verse 17. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. In other words, Paul is saying that the proclamation of the gospel cannot be enhanced by words of human wisdom. But it is rather rendered ineffective by the words of human wisdom. Do you see that? He said, I preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest or unless the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 
completely rendered useless. In other words, Paul didn't bring in to the gospel message his own ideas, his own interpretation, his own philosophy, his own wisdom, or the wisdom of man. He preached the gospel purely. He knew that anything added to it or anything taken away from it would render the gospel of none effect. To alter the gospel message with words of man's wisdom is ineffective as well because to the unconverted heart, the gospel is considered foolishness. In verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. To the unconverted heart, the gospel is considered foolishness. In chapter 2 and verse, verses 13 and 14, Paul says this, uh, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the unconverted, Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so to alter the gospel message with words of man's wisdom is ineffective because to the unconverted heart, the gospel is considered foolishness. But to the heart of faith, the gospel delivers the transforming power of God. Notice again in verse 18. Unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The gospel delivers transforming power to the heart of all who believe it. This is why Paul told the Corinthian believers at the beginning of chapter 2 that he didn't come with the words of man's wisdom. Notice in verse 1 of chapter 2, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Exactly what he said back in verse 17. I've not been called to baptize. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Verse 3 of chapter 2, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? Verse 5, That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we see the importance of the gospel message. It is a message of power to everyone who believes. It is a message of foolishness to everyone in unbelief. And Paul's sole focus, his one purpose, was to proclaim the gospel pure and unadulterated. Not with man's wisdom, Otherwise, the cross of Christ is of no value to those listening to his message. You see, number one, it's important. But I'd like you to notice in verses 19 and 20, it's effect. In verse 18, he says, For the preaching of the, God, uh, of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, Paul says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. It's quoting from Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14 where God is speaking to his people and he's saying, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. Then he says, For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. And the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. In other words, God says, I am going to turn their wisdom into foolishness. 
I am going to expose man's wisdom as useless, as worthless. The wisdom of their wise men shall perish, God said, and the understanding of their fruit of men shall be hid. This is the effect of the gospel. Notice in verse 20, Paul asks the questions, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world, or the, 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 uh, uh, the, the person who likes to debate? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You see, Paul is telling these folks that you preach the gospel, God uses it to expose the foolishness of man's wisdom. Though the gospel looks foolish to them, God will confound them, literally make them ashamed, is the gospel message is a message of power. And so the effect of the gospel next to man's wisdom is to reveal man's wisdom for what it is. The gospel shows man's way, man's solutions, man's ideas, man's philosophies. And it shows them to be false, to be empty, to be foolish, to be ineffective. In chapter 3 of his letter to the Corinthians, verses 18 through 20, Paul says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. The wisdom in this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So we see the effect. In verse 20, Paul asks the question, where is the wise? In other words, where are the ones who, 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 who flout their worldly wisdom? And the understood answer is God has shown them to be frauds. God has shown their wisdom to be worthless. And his wisdom to be powerful. Where is the scribe, the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That's the effect of the gospel message. When you proclaim the gospel message, some may laugh, some may score, some may ignore it because they think it's foolish. The moment a person receives that gospel message, they believe it, and they repent of their sins, the power of God on the salvation is fully revealed, and the wisdom of men is completely turned upside down and made be manifest as the foolishness that it is. So we see the importance of the gospel message. We see its effect. Notice with me in verses 21 through 25, the reality. It's reality. For after that, Paul says in verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. A little bit of a tongue twister there, but what Paul is saying here is, look, the world by its own wisdom could not find God. The world by its own wisdom cannot know God. And God in his wisdom chose the foolishness of preaching to save them. Notice, after that, in the wisdom of the God, uh, in the wisdom of God, when the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased him by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You see, the pleasure of God saw man in his feeble wisdom, incapable of knowing him, and ordained that man would come to faith by the preaching of the good news. Isn't that what he said in Romans uh, chapter 10? How shall I hear without a preacher? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Notice in verse 22, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. This is how people of the day were looking for God and were 
were, were seeking to come to know God. The Jews, they were looking for a sign. The Greeks, they were looking for the for, for the pinnacle of wisdom. They were looking to reach the peak of man's wisdom in the world. And so man's wisdom says things like, I must have a sign to know God. God, God. God needs to reveal himself. He needs to show himself so that I can see him, so that I can know him. And man's wisdom sometimes says, uh, 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 says I, need, I need to be enlightened with more wisdom to know God. I need to gain more knowledge so that I can see God. That's man's wisdom. That's what the Jews were saying. That's what the Greeks were saying. They were requiring a sign. They were seeking after wisdom. God's ordained plan, however, is that man come to God by meeting the proclaimed Christ. And that's why Paul said in verse 23, notice it with me, but we preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. We don't show people a sign. We don't, we don't speak long uh, oratories of, of man's wisdom. We simply preach Christ crucified. That is God's means by which man can come to God by believing the simple gospel message. We preach Christ crucified, he said, unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Though he was to the Jews in Paul's day someone that they stumbled over. Speaking of Lord Jesus Christ, sorry. Though, he, though, though Christ was to the Jews in Paul's day someone that they stumbled over, and the Gentiles in Paul's day someone that they scoffed at, he was found to be someone entirely different to those who were saved by faith. Notice how he says it. Under the Jews, Christ is a stumbling block. They didn't believe him. They crucified him. Under the Greeks, he's foolishness. Simply a foolish fraud. I'm going to die. This false message. That's what they thought of Christ. So in verse 24, and then unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's who Christ is. He may be a stumbling block to the Jews. He may be foolishness to the Greeks, but unto them which are called, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's, noted, it, it's interesting how he describes Christ there because he correlates directly back to what they were looking for when they were looking for God. What did he say they're looking for? In verse 22, the Jews were looking for a sign. The Greeks were looking for more wisdom. What does he say Christ is? Christ is the power of God. What, 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 what better sign could you have than the power of God in the gospel life-changing message? The, Jew, the, the Greeks were looking after wisdom. Christ is made, Paul says, in verse 24, to them which, that which are called, he has made both the power of God and the wisdom of God. They were looking for man's wisdom in wrong places. They should have been looking to Christ because he was the sign of power, of God's power. He was the wisdom of God. Christ is the power and wisdom of God, rendering every other, uh, rendering other, every other power and wisdom irrelevant. Because God's perceived foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom, and God's perceived weakness is stronger than man's power. Notice with me in verse 25, how he says, Christ is power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, than, than, than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Is there any foolishness in God? Is there any weakness in God? 
No, but that was the claim of those who are seeking him in their own way. And so Paul says that foolishness that you attribute to God is wiser than men. That weakness that you attribute to God is stronger than men. So any other power, any other wisdom in the world is irrelevant. Because God's perceived foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom and God's perceived weakness is stronger than man's power. So we see the power of the gospel message, verses 17 through 25. It is the focal point of Paul's ministry. And it should be the focal point of any spiritual conversation you and I have an unsafe person because it is the power of God. There's no argument that you can give in your wisdom that will ever measure up to the power of simply giving the message of Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. God's wisdom is not only seen in the gospel message but it's also evident in the gospel messenger. We're talking this morning about the confounding message and messenger of God. So we see, number one, the gospel message. Number two, we see the gospel messenger. Who is it that God uses to proclaim the gospel, to preach the gospel? Don't be scared of that word, preach. Simply means to herald the good news, to tell it out. Every believer is called to that responsibility. Let's notice first, in regard to the gospel messenger, who he chooses. Who does God choose to proclaim the gospel message? Verse 26. For ye, who is he speaking to? Every member of the church in the city of Corinth. For ye see your calling, brethren. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And so here we see who God chooses. Who is the gospel messenger that God is looking for to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, dead, buried, and risen again? Look, here's, what, here's where the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And here's where the weakness of God is stronger than, than, than men. The world is looking for the wise. They're looking for the noble. They're looking for the mighty. But God is not restricted to the wise, the noble, and the mighty. In fact, by and large, Paul says, he uses those who do not fit that template. Again in verse 26. Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And so the wisdom and power of God is in the fact that he can take that which is foolish to the world, that which is weak in the world's eyes, that which is base, and that literally means without kin. In other words, you don't have a, a pedigree. You don't come with a, a big name. God's not looking for a big name in people. The wisdom and power of God is in the fact that he can take somebody like that, somebody who looks foolish to the world, somebody who doesn't look like much or sound like much, that which even the world despises. And God can, can even take that which does not exist in the eyes of the world. He can use that person to accomplish his purposes. Notice with me again in verse 27. God has chosen who? The foolish things of the world? To confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world? To confound the things that, that are mighty. God has chosen the base things of the world? Verse 28. God has chosen the things which are despised? 
Yea, God has even chosen the things that are not. In other words, people the world pays absolutely no attention to. What does he do with those kind of people? In verse 28 it says, he brings to naught things that are. That's the power of God. That's the wisdom of God, that God can take that kind of person and use them to accomplish his purposes. Notice that word in verse 27, confound. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. The word translated confound there conveys this idea of bringing somebody to shame, of making someone ashamed. God's gospel messengers bring shame to the purveyors of worldly wisdom. Their God-empowered life exposes the facade of the artificial self-empowered living of the worldly wise. They may sound good, they may look good, but when the gospel is preached by a nobody, God exposes them for who they are. He brings shame upon them. And so we see who God chooses to be a gospel messenger. I'd like you to notice, number two, why he chooses them. Why does God choose the foolish? Why does he choose those who are weak? Why does he choose the base things, the things which are despised, the things which are not? Why? Notice in verse 29 through 31 the answer that no flesh should glory in his presence. But, if, but, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That's so why God chooses the foolish and the weak and the despised and the base, that he would receive the ultimate glory. That's always been God's design. God's design has always been that he be glorified. Where his human tools filled with human wisdom, might, and nobility, they would glory in themselves in God's presence and they would rob God of the glory that he deserves. And that's why Paul says in verse 29 that no flesh should glory in God's presence. God chooses the foolish, God chooses the weak and the despised. Because he knows that they won't stand in his presence and say, well, look what I have done. God's messengers being, rather than God's messengers being self-sufficient and self-glorifying, he has called them to be God-dependent and God-glorifying. Toward that end, God has provided it, Christ, be everything that they need. Look with me at verse 30. God takes the foolish, God takes the weak, God takes the base things and despised things, and he gives them everything they need to proclaim the gospel message as he has planned. Verse 30, but of him, of God, are ye in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that Jesus is made by God or of God in us or unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We looked the last two weeks in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 about the life of Christ in us. That's what he's speaking about here. Paul said, it's no longer I that lives, but Christ in me. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And that's what Paul's referencing here in 1 Corinthians 1.30 where he says, 
of God are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us. Christ is made unto us. The, uh, to, uh, to us who have been chosen as God's gospel messengers. Us who are weak, who are foolish, who are despised. Christ is made to us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification. Redemption. All of these things are what we need to be the gospel messengers that God has called us to be. God has provided all these things to us through the indwelling Christ. We see in John chapter 15 the same idea, abide in me and I in you. That the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. All of the spiritual sustenance that the messenger of God needs to fulfill the will and purpose of God is his through Christ. God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. As the resources of the weak and foolish come from the supply of the uh, indwelling of Christ, there is no reason to glory in anything other than God himself. Any child of God that boasts can only boast in Christ alone. Notice with me in verse 31 that, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. One of the wonderful messages that God gave to his people through the prophet Isaiah is found in chapter 42, verses 6 through 8. Where he says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. See, the gospel messenger is just a simple channel for the gospel message. He is not to seek to be wise, mighty, or noble. He is to simply seek to be a channel for God's glory. Notice with me, if you would, in Acts chapter 4, one example. And then we'll conclude Acts chapter 4. Forgive me, I meant to write down the reference, but I, I failed to do so. So I think we begin in verse 8. And uh, Peter stands here before Annas and Caiaphas, high priest. They ask him, by what power, by what name have you done this? We see in verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, get ready, he's, he's about to preach Christ crucified here, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, When God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This, Jesus, is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You see here, the gospel message is being preached. It's foolishness to them, right? He knows it's foolishness to them because he's telling them they crucified Jesus. Preaches the gospel message simple and unvarnished. He tells them, Look, 
There's no salvation in any other place. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Stop looking for a sign. Stop looking for more wisdom. Jesus Christ is the answer. See the gospel message there that Paul is talking about. It's foolishness of the world. But it must be preached. You see the messenger in verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were what? Unlearned and ignorant men. Does that remind you of anything we just looked at in verses 26 through 31? Not many wise men after the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to found the wise. That's how they looked to these people. They looked at them. They saw their boldness. They perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. And what did they do? They were. The power of God was evident. They took knowledge of them. That they had been with Jesus. Folks, that's how our lives are to play out. We proclaim the message of Christ. God takes us weak, foolish, despised as we are. He makes people ashamed. Those who had crucified Christ listened and they were ashamed when they saw their boldness. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I'd like to make application in two ways for you this morning. Number one, God's people must be clear-eyed about the gospel. The gospel, as Paul said, is the power of God, Romans 1.16. It is the power of God unto salvation. It is God's power to transform lives, and nothing else is. The gospel message is the simple death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. Though the world will look at it as foolishness, we must look at it as their only hope. The world will not be changed through modern psychology, social programs, political revolution, or any other product of human wisdom. So the believer must reject all of these things and embrace the foolishness of preaching. Sadly, in many pulpits and in many, many churches across this nation, many other things have been substituted for the gospel. Many other things have been added in to the gospel. As if it's not powerful enough to do the job that God sent it to do. We look for answers to our problems and to our struggles, and we look for answers to help someone else. In the latest Christian book, or on so and so's program on channel such and such, we go to Google. And even believers have added to the gospel psychology, social justice, political philosophies and ideas. And in doing so, we made the cross of Christ of none of that. Folks, we must see the gospel alone as the answer. We must not seek to augment the gospel with worldly wisdom of any type. We must turn off the TV, the radio. Turn off the computer. Skip that trip to the Christian bookstore. Pull out the scriptures. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needed Live with the power of the gospel.
Number one, God's people must be clear-eyed about the gospel and trust that Paul's words here have helped you towards that end. But number two, God's people must be clear-eyed about their role as a gospel messenger. If you are a child of God, if you have a living relationship with the God of heaven, you are a gospel messenger. You are a witness, you are a testimony to what Christ has done in your life for those who need it in their lives. God is not looking for a select few to spread his good news. The gospel has been placed in the hands of every believer. And it is the foolish, the weak, the base, and the despised that, is, that God is looking to use and his glory might shine all the brighter. So are you living as a channel of the gospel message? Or are you making excuses, I'm not eloquent enough. I don't know my Bible good enough. I am just not that personality type. I don't know what I would say. Folks, there's no excuse for not doing what God has called us to do. Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. All that we need, we have in him. Preach the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 20, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and old, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, and hath given unto us what? The ministry of reconciliation. Would it that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto him, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors of Christ. The unified work of God's Holy Spirit is carried out in a clear understanding of the gospel message as a solution for every person's sin. And a clear understanding of every believer's responsibility to share the gospel of Christ with those who need to hear. Father in heaven, I pray that you would again take your truth. As we've examined it this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit would shed light upon our hearts and lives to see, Lord, where we have looked to other means to help people come to God or be attracted to God. Father, our purpose is not to make the gospel attractive. Our purpose is not to make people think nicely about Christ, about the church, about our lives. Our purpose and our responsibility, as we've seen the Apostle Paul, is simply to preach Christ and Christ crucified. It's not to be mistaken about that. Satan will love nothing better, Lord, than to distract us from that central message. And Lord, I ask as well that you would humble our hearts to be the gospel messengers of Father in heaven, I pray that you would remind us again of our responsibility. I pray that you would show us that in our weakness, that in our perceived foolishness, is your power, your strength, your wisdom. Lord, if we I have not in Christ. We can do nothing. Help us, dear God, depend upon your Holy Spirit, the life of Jesus within.
proclaim the gospel message every opportunity you give us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.